The Body Island Lighthouse sits at the center of a strip of land that has been dubbed the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The 200 steps from its base to its light is equivalent to climbing a 10-story building without aid. To this day, its first order Fresnel lens still burns bright, guarding one of the most treacherous sections of shoreline in North America. History records that the Body Island received its name from an early landowner, but folks on the island will tell you a darker tale. They claim it was named for the many bodies that washed up on the shore. Indeed, in the decade prior to the lighthouse's construction in 1872, Body Island claimed 41 ships and countless lives. The shoreline is as treacherous as our human desires, inviting ships to shore only to destroy them on the way. Most people who struggle with anxiety deeply desire to be rid of it, and that desire tosses them to and fro like the waves of North Carolina's Outer Banks. Desire, it's your third key word in your battle with anxiety. In fact, what I want to encourage you to think about is that if you're going to have victory over anxiety, you're going to need to desire God more than you desire the relief from the anxiety. Now, one of the things about the Bible is that it uses the Greek word epithemia to communicate desire. And that word doesn't communicate whether it's a good or bad desire, it just communicates desire. The object of the word will communicate whether it's a good or bad desire. For instance, if I were to tell you that a man desires to spend quality time with his wife, that would be a good desire. But if I just change two words and I say, that man desires to spend quality time with another man's wife, you would all say that's a bad desire. The word itself doesn't make it good or bad. The object of the word makes it good or bad. And that's exactly what we face with anxiety. We need to learn to desire God more than we desire relief from the anxiety. Fortunately, Psalm 37 gives us a wonderful engagement with how we can think about that in regards to the issue of anxiety or worry. Psalm 37, one says this, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. And verse seven says, don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Now in two verses, verse one and verse seven, you receive the charge from God not to worry. But what's really cool about this passage is that in between those two commands not to worry, you find four commands of what you should do. It's like God is saying, listen, I'm not only gonna tell you what not to do, I'm gonna tell you what to do. Notice the first two in verses three and four. Trust in the Lord and do good, and then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Now the idea of trusting in the Lord is difficult, isn't it? Particularly when our circumstances are challenging and when anxiety tends to be rolling in. The first two commands we find in Psalm 37, three and four. Trust in the Lord and do good, and then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. The first command is this, that we are to trust in the Lord, which is challenging when circumstances are difficult and when anxiety is rolling in. But I have learned in my relationship with the Lord that the better that I know Him, the more that I can trust Him. The better that I know Him, the more that I can trust Him. Which means that you and I should be developing an ongoing relationship in our knowledge of the Lord, and we'll find it easier to trust Him. When my children were young, one of them said, Dad, how can I believe in God if I can't see him? And so I took her and I placed her on a chair and I put a blindfold around her eyes and I said, here's what I want you to do. Can you see me? And she said, no. I said, on the count of three, I want you to jump to me. And I counted to three and she, with a little smile underneath the blindfold, jumped to me and fortunately I caught her. And when I took the blindfold off, I've always remembered that when I asked her the question, could you see me? She said, no. I said, then why did you jump to me? And she said, because you're my dad and I believed your words. That's exactly what God does with us. He gives us his word so that we can know him and therefore we can trust him. In the back of the book, you're gonna find a triangle. That triangle talks about three characteristics of God that are perfect in your battle with anxiety. 
Um, they are the fact that God is all loving. That forms one side of the triangle. The fact that he is all wise and the fact that he is all powerful. When you take those three together, God is all loving, God is all wise, God is all powerful. You learn these truths about God. He is all loving. He wants what's best for you. He is all wise. He knows what's best for you. And he is all powerful. He has the ability to accomplish what is best for you. I want you to picture yourself as the middle of that triangle. If you begin to think that God isn't wise or God isn't loving or God isn't powerful, what you want to do is, is realize that that's the part, the characteristic of God, that you need to begin to study so that you can know him better, so that you can fully trust him. The second command is delight in the Lord. That sounds similar, doesn't it, to Paul's command in Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, he said, and again I say rejoice. Now initially you might say, well, how am I going to rejoice or delight in the Lord when I have these feelings or thoughts of anxiety that are all-consuming? It's going to depend which one you desire more. Years ago, um, we had an older woman in our church who was incredibly wise, and she said to me once, when she battled with anxiety, particularly at night, when she struggled with a difficult circumstance she'd gone through, she said, I was always thinking about it at night. And so I said, so what did you do? And she said, what I did was I began to list the things I knew about God to be true right through the alphabet. I started with A and I'd lay in bed when anxiety would wake me up, and I'd say, God is able, He is awesome, He is all-knowing. I go to B, he is beautiful, he is my benefactor. I go to C, he is the conqueror, he is the Christ. I go to D, he is my deliverer. I go to E, he is eternal. I go to F, he is my friend. And she said I would rehearse those qualities of God right through the alphabet. And what she was doing was she was building, as it were, a mental library, a, a library that she could resource and return to to remember that she could delight in the Lord. I would encourage you to do the same, A to Z, the qualities and characteristics of God. Now notice the last two commands are found in verse 5 and verse 7. Verse 5, commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him and he will help you. And verse 7, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Now the word commit in the Hebrew literally means to roll something over. Like the weight is too heavy for you and I to carry, so we roll it over on someone else who can carry it. We let them carry it for us. In fact, remember those circles of control we talked about in the first lesson? All those elements that are outside of your circle of control, those are the things you want to roll over to the Lord. You want to say, Lord, this is yours. I am committing my way. I'm rolling those things over to you. Now notice the final command. There it is in verse 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord. It's a tough thing, isn't it, when you're anxious to actually think that you could be still. Every part of your body, every part of your mind, and every part of your emotion is acting with anxiety. Here's how I want you to think about that. I want you to remember when you look at that passage that it is possible, but it's only possible so long as you do the first three commands. You just can't be still unless you learn to trust him, unless you learn to delight in him, unless you learn to commit your way to him. In fact, Isaiah 30, 15 said of the Israelites, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. But Isaiah added, but you were unwilling. I want to encourage you, trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord, and be still before the Lord. John Piper was fond of saying that God is most glorified in you and me when we are most satisfied in him. May you find your delight in the Lord. As you break for your questions, take time tonight to work through them and begin your list and your, your list of your A to Z about who God is like. Share those in the group as you encourage one another, and I'll be back in a moment to wrap it up. Welcome back. By way of review, in this lesson, we have learned the importance of desiring God more than we desire relief from anxiety. I recognize that's challenging and difficult, but as you work on those four commands, trust in the Lord, 
commit your way to the Lord, delight in the Lord, and be still before the Lord, you'll find that it's possible. In the upcoming week, take a look at the chapter on doing what Jesus did. That will prepare you for our next time together. And stay attentive to your daily Bible reading. Don't let that slip. And spend time memorizing those scriptures and practice praying for the issues of your anxiety through the prayer patterns we learned in the last lesson.